Welcome back to another episode of Wrong Sports, and this will be another episode of Discontinued. And to give you a little hint on what school I'm covering this time, when you think California for college football, you probably think the Rose Bowl or USC or UCLA or Stanford or, or someone in the Pac-12, right? Well, back in the 1930s and 40s, there was another school that was getting a lot of press for not only winning, but for also doing something a Western school had not done at the time. This is the story of the University of Santa Clara Broncos football team, a team that was discontinued numerous times, but fought back to rise up again. But it was really one rule that ended this college football program, a college football program that managed to go to the Sugar Bowl as well a couple of times. A Western school did that. But before I tell you the story of Santa Clara, make sure you check me out on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash wrong sports or just search wrong sports on Patreon. Also, of course, make sure you subscribe Subscribe to the channel, please, at the bottom. Ring the bell as well to give you a heads up on when I'm dropping new episodes. And as always, like this video and share this video and follow me on Twitter at SportsWronged. But the story of the Santa Clara Broncos football team started just before the 1900s as Santa Clara had a football squad as far back as 1896. I could only find game results as far back as 1902 though. The teams that they played were mostly athletic clubs through the San Francisco area as well as some freshman squads from Cal and Stanford. From 1902 to 1905, they were coached by Gene Sheehy, who was a teacher on campus and led the team to a 7-5-4 record during that time. And also, they had a close 6 to nothing loss to Stanford in 1902, which was pretty big since Stanford went to the Rose Bowl the previous year. After the 1905 season, though, there was a lot of changes that came from injuries and deaths from college football in the years previous. And along with the changes, there were also some teams that shut down their program until the game was a little safer. Santa Clara was one of those Schools that would shut the program but come back in 1908. During the 1910s, Santa Clara went through many coaches but also had a winning decade that decade. Santa Clara would have an undefeated 9-0 record in 1916 and another 9-win season in 1917. During these two seasons, they went on an 18-game winning streak, including beating Stanford. But that team would take a break for World War I in 1918 before coming back for one of their strongest decades in the 1920s. They would start with an 11-1 one record, and then they would have an undefeated 1921 season, but they mostly played against Navy squads, American Legion teams, and much smaller Western schools. Santa Clara would then add Arizona and Nevada to the schedule before adding some more bigger Pacific Coast teams like Cal and USC, who were coming off an undefeated Rose Bowl season. By 1925, under their new coach Adam Walsh, Santa Clara was playing a full college schedule. But with this new better schedule, it resulted in a lot of five and four seasons. Like, they had about five in a row at one point. With them only beating Stanford, and then they lost badly to USC and Cal all the times they played them throughout the 1920s. One final note was that Santa Clara would be one of the first teams to travel across the Pacific Ocean to play in Hawaii. They played a couple of Hawaiian teams. After getting through that last decade at 500, Santa Clara would continue that trend in the 1930s under a new coach, Maurice Clipper-Smith. Clipper Smith was a former Notre Dame guard on Newt Rockney's first team, and he graduated in 1920, so he even blocked for George Gipp as well at Notre Dame. After school, Smith did something that not many players were doing, especially ones from the Midwest, and that was taking a head coaching job out west, as he took a job at what is now known as the University of Portland, going to Gonzaga and having winning records there, finally ending up at Santa Clara. And I mentioned that not a lot of players, especially players from the Midwest or the East were taking Western coaching jobs. That was because football out West was not really playing at the level of Eastern or even Midwestern schools. Most of the only Western schools that were playing at the level of an Eastern school were big schools like USC, Cal, or Stanford, or schools that could be invited to the Rose Bowl. But when Smith got to Santa Clara, he mostly had 500 records. Actually, he had those five and four records, which they were famous for, for uh, the 1920s and 1930s. His best season though would come in 1934. The season started well with a tie versus Stanford before they rattled off wins versus Cal, University of San Francisco, and Nevada. Santa Clara were now 6-0-1, but would suffer season-ending defeats to St. Mary's and to TCU, who were the best team in the Southwest, to end their season 6-2-1. Smith would leave just after the 1936 season, but Smith also had a hand in ushering the next coach and their best teams to this school. 
Smith would have a hand in finding their next coach because Santa Clara looked to the sidelines for their next coach as they would promote their line coach, Lawrence T. Buckshaw. He was a former Notre Dame great who played alongside Clipper Smith and the Gipper and had a Notre Dame record that stood for 50 years as he had the most extra points kicked. Shaw would start his head coaching run at NC State in 1924, only winning two games, but Shaw was always looking for a challenge, like his friend Smith, and he came out west a year later to coach Nevada for four years, but Shaw would only go 10, 20, and 3 at his four seasons in Nevada and resign to take work with Standard Oil in the late 1928 in early 1929. And it was somewhere around the summer of 1929 that Shaw was talked into taking an assistant head coaching job at Santa Clara, probably by his friend and former line mate Clipper Smith. But it was a bad time for the economy as the stock market crashed a couple of weeks later after the season started. Shaw was only working for the school during the season, and he would have to work his other job at Standard Oil as well during that time to make ends meet. It wasn't until Santa Clara hired him as a full-time coach in 1936 that Shaw would make a living as a coach and he didn't have to work another job. But as soon as Buck Shaw was hired, he would have his best teams, and I talked about this team in my best underrated teams of the 1930s, and I'll put a link above. But this first team in 1936 had some great talent. Running the off offense was their back, Nello Felicezzi, and on their line they had a future NFL All-Pro and college first-teamer, Dick Bazzi. They powered through their first four games with three shutouts before they welcomed Southern Power Auburn. Santa Clara would shut them out and gain their first top 10 ranking. Their only loss of the season would come to Sammy Baugh and TCU late in the season, but Santa Clara was still invited to the Sugar Bowl where they played and beat number two and formerly unbeaten LSU to end their season 8-1 and one and have a final ranking of number 6. It was the first time that a Western power was invited to the Sugar Bowl and won, and it wasn't Buckshaw's first season. Well, you'd be thinking in year two that the team might have a slide since last season was pretty much their best season, and also their two best players, Nello Felicezzi and Dick Bazzi, were gone this year. But instead, this team just improved as they had an even better line, offensive and defense, than the previous year. They also started this season with a 13-7 win over Stanford, and that would be their only touchdown the defense gave up for the rest of the year. Yeah, this team was so good as they shut out 7 out of 9 of their opponents, with their only blemish being a safety in their 25-2 win over San Jose State. They were invited to the Sugar Bowl again to play LSU again. LSU that weren't unbeaten coming into this game, but they were still ranked in the top 10. The game was muddy and rainy, and Santa Clara and LSU had a bunch of fumbles, but Santa Clara would score in the first quarter and use their fantastic defensive line to hold off LSU and win 6 to nothing and have an undefeated season. The 1938 season started with Buckshaw 17-1 overall, and they were on a 10-game winning streak. The team played less Western teams this year as they played Texas A&M, Arkansas, and Michigan State in East Lansing, and Santa Clara won them all. Their winning streak would be 16 games, but unfortunately would end as they would lose to St. Mary's late in the season and also lose to Detroit in a late November game for a 6-2 final record. Their final year of the decade was kind of wacky, and it had a pretty different start than the other years under Buckshaw, as they started 0-2-1, but they would then go unbeaten the rest of the season, including having four wins in a row, with wins over Stanford, Purdue, and Michigan State, before tying UCLA and having a final record of 5-1-3. This gave Shaw 28 wins this decade, only four wins less than his predecessor, who had two more seasons than him. The 1940s continued to be good for Shaw and Santa Clara. As they started the season beating Utah and UCLA, they then traveled to Stanford, who were much improved from the previous season, but Santa Clara stayed with Stanford only losing by one, and this was Stanford's closest game all year as they went undefeated and won a national title in 1940. They then came back to the West Coast for the rest of the year and didn't lose, including facing a new opponent in Oklahoma, which came to Santa Clara after Thanksgiving and lost to Buckshaw and the Broncos by 20. 
that four-game winning streak to end the 1940 season traveled over to 1941 as they started 4-0 with wins over Michigan State and Cal. But after that mini streak, the Broncos and Shaw ran into their first ever losing streak as they lost three in a row. And they were all on the road too, traveling to Oklahoma, then to Stanford, and then finally to Oregon. But they got over that pretty quick as they won their last two games, with one over UCLA to be 6-3 in 1941. But like most of my wrong sports episodes, when I get to the 1940s, you start to hear me talk about World War II because that starts to get in the way right around now. The 1942 season was happening during the war, so Santa Clara didn't travel at all outside the West, only playing in Oregon and Utah for one game each. The season was still a winning one, as they had a 7-2 record, only losing to UCLA and St. Mary's pre-flight, which was an Air Force team playing out of St. Mary's University. And if you want to know more about service football teams and just about service football and college football in general during World War II, you got to check out the link above. I have a great three-part episode about service football teams during the 1943, 44, and 45 season. And just like most college football teams during World War II, Santa Clara would be disbanded, but Buckshaw would end up staying on campus to help the Army's physical fitness program, which was also happening on the campus of Santa Clara. Shaw would eventually leave just before the 1945 season to coach at Cal, and Santa Clara would announce that in late 1945 and early 1946 that the football team was going to be coming back. The only thing was the football team wasn't going to be having Shaw anymore, as Shaw had already committed to a new pro league the All-American Football Conference, but Buck Shaw at Santa Clara had a 47-10-4 record and won two big bowl games, which was something that no other coach for Santa Clara did or would do in the future. But even though Shaw wasn't there, Santa Clara was going to be trekking on, and they were keeping their winning ways as they stayed with an alumni and an assistant under Shaw and Len Casanova to be the next coach. Casanova was a punter in the mid-1920s and was also a top assistant under Shaw. Casanova got off to a losing start as the team won only two games in 1946 before getting to a 4-4-1 four, four, record in 1947. Those two seasons led to the next few years for the team as they broke out in 1948 and 49. The 1948 season had them win seven games, including beating the likes of Oklahoma, which had Bud Wilkerson in his second season coaching there. They also beat Stanford and tied against Michigan State. This led to their 1949 season, which started with a loss to Cal, but that just fueled them for the rest of the season, as they went 7-0-1 over their next eight games, including shutting out and beating the undefeated and ranked UCLA during that streak. They were on their way to a bowl game invite when they traveled to Oklahoma to play Wilkerson and the Sooners again. The Sooners were much better than they were in 1948, as they were unbeaten coming into this game and beating everyone by two touchdowns or more. Even though Oklahoma were undefeated, Santa Clara played them tough, as they were within 7 points at half and going into the 4th quarter, but this game had a total of 13 fumbles, with 7 by Santa Clara, resulting in their defeat 28-21. But this game still pushed them to be invited to the Orange Bowl, to play against the University of Kentucky. And this game was kind of like their last game, because they played another famous and legendary coach, Bear Bryant. University of Kentucky were 9-2, but Casanova coached this team up and they had a 14-13 lead late in the fourth quarter before finally getting a final touchdown and dagger to win this game 21-13. Casanova would leave after the bowl game and would go on to coach Pittsburgh and then go on to Oregon where he would also coach them to an Orange Bowl. The reason for Casanova leaving was because he heard that the school was going to drop the football team, or really just stop spending money on the team altogether, and he left before he could see any of that happen. The next coach that would see that happen would be Richard Gallagher. He was an assistant under Paul Brown in the new All-American Football Conference, and he took the Santa Clara job after turning down the pit job after seeing Casanova going after it. He would later say that he shouldn't have even taken the Santa Clara job because pro football in the 1950s was getting really, really good, and if he would have stayed with that pro team and with Paul Brown, he could have gotten a professional head coaching job. Gallagher would come to the campus with a pretty good staff who had some experience with professional and college coaching. 
But even though he was giving the team a really good coaching staff, the school wasn't providing him or the team with some pretty good facilities, as the team didn't even have a home stadium on campus, and they played all of their games at Kaiser Stadium, which is a community stadium for colleges in San Francisco. St. Mary's and also University of San Francisco played there as well. The first season for Gallagher had the school play only two games at Kaiser, with the rest of them being on the road, and that's because obviously they had to share that stadium with two other colleges, and the road games weren't West Coast road games, as they had to travel to Texas to play Rice, and then travel to Wisconsin to play Marquette. They lost these away games, by the way, as well as others to finish the season 3-7. and seven. They did finish their season with a win over St. Mary's, which was pretty big because St. Mary's would drop their program only weeks later. The start to the 1950s wasn't that good, but they were hoping with that season finale win over St. Mary's that 1951 was going to go pretty good. But it didn't start that way, as they started 0-3, but they would beat Arkansas only a week after Arkansas beat number 4 Texas. That would lead to Santa Clara playing the 1951 University of San Francisco team, and if you know about them, you know how good they were before they ended their program. Santa Santa Clara would lose to them, and Santa Clara ended their season with only three wins again. So now Santa Clara would be the only team playing in the city of San Francisco going into 1952, as the University of San Francisco ended their program in 1951, and St. Mary's ended it in 1950. And the 1952 season started a lot like 1951, as they went 0-4, and they lost all of these games on the road against Cal, Kansas, and Stanford. The team would play one game at Kaiser Stadium in front of only 5,000 fans. And it was a win over Idaho, but that really didn't matter because the team finished 2-6-1. and one. But they did win their finale too, so that was pretty good and you should remember that. That season finale win gave Gallagher a final record of 8-18-2, and, and he would resign shortly after the final game and went looking to go back to the pros. But his resignation only put more salt in the wound after finding out that the program was being shut down due to massive financial losses and due to the fact that other teams like I mentioned University of San Francisco and their big rival St. Mary's shuttered their programs in the years previous. But back to those financials as they lost over $150,000 for the 1951 and 52 seasons and even though they won the Orange Bowl game it didn't really help them financially in the seasons after that because the team didn't draw all that well. The team and even the coaching staff were caught off guard by the shuttering of the program program because they had games scheduled for the 1953 season, including one against Oklahoma, but it seemed like after St. Mary's and San Francisco ended their programs that Santa Clara also had the same thoughts that they couldn't make football work either. Obviously the closing of the program angered students and alumni, but there was going to be no football in 1953, but there was the thought that they were going to potentially bring back the program eventually. Those thoughts didn't come around until around the late 1954 early 1955 school year. As the school had announced, they were going to be bringing back the program once they got the financials figured out about, you know, how they were going to work all this. Well, that took them a few years. It actually took them five years, in fact, as they would announce the football program would be back for 1959. Now, a lot of things changed in college football in the seasons they weren't around. Like, number one, they couldn't really get a good big-time coach, and also, they weren't going to be playing big-time college football either, at least to start, as the 1959 season would be a shortened season, though they were basically a new program, so they kind of had to play a shortened season. The school would be coached this season by Pat Malley. Malley was an alumni and played on the team in 1950 and 51 as an offensive guard, and and after that, he would stay at Santa Clara and coach the freshman team for the 1952 season. Now, the freshman team was really good in 1952, and a lot of people were looking forward to that freshman team becoming varsity in 1953, but obviously with the shuttering of the program, that wouldn't happen. Also with that happening, Malley would go to the Army for four years before coaching at his former high school and then coming back to Santa Clara to coach the Revive team. The team was basically a new program, like I said, as they would no longer play teams like USC, Stanford, Michigan State, or really any teams that you would now call an FBS Division I school. 
Instead, Santa Clara would be part of the College Division, which before 1973 consisted mostly of Division II, Division III, and lower schools all playing each other, and you've heard me mention this in other discontinued videos. The schedule for 1959 only consisted of five games, and most of them were against service squads, with two of them against the University of San Francisco, which by this point were like a club team or maybe an NAIA school. The team would finish 4-1 and, and went to the 1960s getting ready for some actual competition. Santa Clara didn't join a conference as they would continue to be an independent school. That way they would be able to schedule schools within a close distance and mostly schools in California, which made up about 90% of their schedule going forward. The team was good through the 1960s, but started to get really good in 1963 as they had six wins. Another thing that happened this year was that they finally opened their new stadium and they called it Buck Shaw Stadium. And it was located on the campus too. This seemed to help the school because in 1963 and the next few years, they improved to seven wins in 1964. The 1965 season started with the team on a five-game winning streak from the previous year, and then they would then go on another five-game winning streak to start the year. But then in Game 6, they faced off against UC Santa Barbara. UCSB were coming into this game 4-1, and one, and these two schools played each other over the last three years, splitting the series. The game was close, but a missed extra point was all that made the difference, as Santa Clara lost 14-13. Santa Clara wouldn't lose again, ending their season 8-1. and one. This was Santa Clara's best season since the 1930s, and Coach Malley was rewarded by becoming the athletic director and would hold that job for the rest of his time. Time at Santa Clara. After that season, Santa Clara would continue to be really good as they were 23 and 4 from 1965 to 67, but after those years they fell back, mostly finishing just above 500. There were two noteworthy seasons, as in 1969 and 70, they had Dan Pastorini at quarterback, which helped the team average 27 points per game in 1969 and 30 points per game in 1970. Unfortunately, the defense really didn't help them out and they gave up a lot of points, resulting in a 6-4 record in 1969 and a 5-4-1 record in 1970. I don't have numbers for Pastorini, but he does have a top 10 passing season in the school's history, plus he was drafted number 3 overall in 1971, which was the highest drafted Santa Clara player. The team would continue to have issues with their offense being really, really good and their defense not being so good. One example being a very weird 1976 season where their offense scored 308 points total, resulting in 28 points per game, but the defense gave up 306 points total, resulting in just under 28 points per game, and somehow this team ended up with a 7-4 record. Very strange. They would struggle for the next two years to find another good team, but would finally find one in 1980. The team started the season with a game versus a Division I opponent, San Jose State, a team they've also played in their previous incarnations. And even though Santa Clara kept it close, they lost, 28 to 14. After that loss, the team turned out to be really good, and Malley coached up the defense to get them to be 4 and 1 and a top 5 ranking in Division 2. But then they would play Cal Poly, who were coming into the game at 2 and 2, but their two losses were to Division 1 teams, Fresno State and Cal Fullerton. The game was being played at home, so Santa Clara was feeling pretty good, but they fell behind and couldn't make up the deficit, and they lost lost 42 to 28. That loss hurt, but Malley and the Broncos would end up pulling off a four-game winning streak in which they averaged 30 points per game, and one of these wins was against UC Davis, a team that rarely if ever lost in the late 1970s and early 80s. That four-game winning streak helped Santa Clara get their first ever invite to the Division II National Championship Tournament. The tournament had only started in 1973 when the NCAA cut down the divisions from two to four, and I'm counting FBS, FCS, Division II, and Division 3, and Santa Clara was never invited to the Division 2 tournament because they weren't independent, so it was pretty hard since the tournament only invited eight schools at the time. The Broncos made their best of their first ever invitation as they would upset Northern Michigan on the road by one point. And yeah, this game was an upset because Santa Clara was playing on the road in Northern Michigan, which is 2,000 miles away from where Santa Clara is located, and also Northern Michigan only lost one time all season to the number one seed in the tournament. 
So after that big upset, Santa Clara and Mally had to go back to California to play a familiar foe in the semi-final round in Cal Poly. The game was a rematch of a few weeks earlier, but it was different because Cal Poly was at home this time. The game would start like the last game as it was 7-7 after the first quarter, but then Cal Poly would score 31 straight points to run away with this game and win 38-14. Santa Clara's season was over, but they did end up losing to the national champions, so at least they lost to the best team that year. The 1981 season would bring something new for Santa Clara, as they would join their first ever conference, joining the Western Football Conference. The Western Football Conference had some familiar teams like Cal Poly, and it helped filled out their schedule and potentially get another tournament invite. The 1982 season started with Santa Clara going 5-0 and scoring 30 points per game, but they met a great team in Game 6 in UC Davis. UC Davis was on a great streak of 11 straight conference titles. They played in the Far West Conference, and they only lost three conference games during those 11 years. Lucky for Santa Clara, the game wasn't a conference game, but Santa Clara could do nothing against UC Davis, and they lost 28-7, losing to future first-round pick at quarterback for UC Davis, Ken O'Brien. Their next big game of the year was against Cal Poly a few weeks later, and they lost there 20-3. That game was big because Cal Poly was in their conference, so the loss pretty much messed up their chances for a conference title. The team sputtered after that to a 7-4 record, including another game versus Division I opponent San Jose State, and they lost that one big by 40. After the end to 1982, Mally got the team ready for 1983, but it was another up-and-down start as the team ended their season 6-4. But something that they did do that was positive was that they won their first ever conference title as they were co-champions of the Western Football Conference that year. After that co-champion year, they came into 1984 with Coach Malley now in his 26th season and now with over 130 wins at the school. This made him the winningest coach in school history, and really, most if not all of the credit for turning around this team and this program should go to him. But after this season, he would announce that he was going to step down as coach due to health reasons. The team rallied around him, and they went 4-0, including beating UC Davis, which went to the Division II tournament later this year, and they were co-champions again. After those wins, it got them ranked in the top 10, but after a close loss to Cal Poly, they followed it up with two more, and they were now 4-3. and three. Their season was still in their hands as they had a November matchup against Portland State, which had a good defense this year, and they were undefeated in conference play. Well, the game wasn't close as Portland State won 27-6, and they would eventually win the conference over Santa Clara. The 1984 season ended with a win over their longtime, now revived rival, St. Mary. The game was a longtime rival due to them playing each other since 1896, and St. Mary was Santa Clara's first team they ever played. The game was also special as it resulted in a 28-6 win for Santa Clara, and it would be the final win for Coach Malley. Malley would step down after the game, and he would remain athletic director, but he would have his untimely passing in May of 1985 due to cancer, and I'll talk more about him at the end of this video. But the passing of Pat Malley would bring in another Malley in his son, Terry Malley. And Terry was a former quarterback in the mid-1970s after Dan Pastorini. He was an assistant for his father for the last five years. Terry took over with a heavy heart, and it was clear that this team was also rallying behind him as well, because they had a great season, going 8-2-1, and, and also going unbeaten in conference play, being 4-0-1, and, and being the champions of their conference, and winning the title outright. Terry Malley was a champion just like his father, and also he was named the Conference Coach of the Year. Along with that, the team also had a notable player this year in Brent Jones, who had the receiving record at Santa Clara, as he had 2,200 receiving yards at the school over four seasons and was drafted and would eventually be picked up by the 49ers, winning three Super Bowls with them. Terry Malley would continue to coach the team through the 1980s, but his team started to fall behind Sacramento State and Portland State in the conference. Due to these two really good teams, Santa Clara would routinely finish third or fourth in the conference through the 1980s, and they always had winning records. But the 1990s would come, and it would hit the school pretty hard for one main reason that would happen right around 1991. 
The reason was that the NCAA put out a new rule saying that schools could not have a majority of their teams at D1 and then have a football team playing at the Division II level. So basically your options were if all of your other teams were playing at Division I, that means you had to move your football team up to Division I, or drop your football team down to a club level, or completely drop your team. The school didn't make a decision immediately about what they were going to do with the football team, but the football team must have known that their days were numbered because they started the season going 4-1, and one, but then they must have heard something during the season, maybe that they were going to drop the sport altogether because they ended the season going 5-6. and six. Even though they ended the season five and six, they didn't get the news immediately that the sport was going to be dropped altogether. But going into the 1992 season, they knew that unless they got a financial miracle, the sport was going to be dropped. And the 1992 season started a lot like 1991, as they started out going 4-2, and two, before a four-game losing streak to end the season, including a 40-14 loss in a Halloween matchup to Cal Poly. The worst thing, though, would be losing their final game of the season versus their rival St. Mary's in a blowout loss, 55-22. Now I mentioned those last two games specifically because it would come out a few weeks after that it was official Santa Clara was going to be dropping their football program. They ended up making the decision because unlike their rival St. Mary's, they didn't have the money or the stadium to move up to the Division 1 AA or single A level. The other issue was if they wanted to move up to the 1AA or the FBS single A level, they had to add scholarships and a lot of them, which means that cost a lot of money. And yeah, the school didn't need any handouts by any means. This school had over a $1 billion endowment, which is much more than any of the other schools I have talked about on my discontinued list, like Detroit and Tampa, which kind of needed the money to move up to Division 1. Yeah, Santa Clara didn't need the money. The only thing was, this school had very high academic standards, and Santa Clara didn't want to spend money on athletics, especially teams that weren't winning. They wanted to spend money on academics and building new academics and dorm buildings on campus, which you know is kind of what a college is supposed to do. Santa Clara Stadium, Buckshaw Stadium, could only hold 6,800 fans, but even at that max attendance, it wasn't enough for 1AA, which usually wanted a minimum of about 10,000 in their stadiums. Plus, Santa Clara was a smaller school, as they only had about 6,000 students at the time that they dropped football, and more than half of them were graduate students, which meant that they were one of the smallest, if not the smallest school, in the Division I or 1AA level. All of those could be the reason, but Santa Clara dropped football and even though there have been plenty of articles about them bringing back the team, it has not come back as of 2021. Santa Clara does have a great record, as they have a 352, 244, and 28 record, so just slightly above winning 58% of their games. They do have a great 3-0 record in bowl games, and in big bowl games too, as they went to two Sugar Bowls and an Orange Bowl, so that is not something a lot of schools that I've gone over in this series can say. Pat Malley has the most wins in school history, and he does have a building on campus named after him, so he is and will always be revered on this campus. Buckshaw is no longer a part of the school though, as his name is no longer part of the stadium, as it was renamed Stevens Stadium in 2015, and I believe a uh, professional soccer team plays there now. Santa Clara though is part of the West Coast Conference right now, which has Gonzaga and their longtime rival St. Mary's in it, and are known to have great soccer teams with their women's Santa Clara team, having won several national titles, and they also have some great players as well that have uh, either made it to the professional level uh, or have made it to the national team level. But even though the soccer team on the Santa Clara campus is really good, the other football team on campus, the American football team on campus, could not make it. And the main reason being was this school was putting education before all other sports. And that's pretty unheard of, especially this school. This school had a lot of money. And you know what they were saying? We have the money and we're putting it all towards education. We are not putting it towards our football or towards our other sports. We don't really care. Because if Santa Clara wanted to keep their football team, they could have easily spent 25 
25, 30 million dollars to renovate their stadium and make it a little bit bigger. Anyway, tell me what you think about Santa Clara and what other schools you want me to go over in this discontinued series. Also, tell me what other ideas or other things you want me to be covering in Wrong Sports as well in the comment section below. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. And also, make sure you check me out on Patreon, patreon.com slash wrong sports. Help out the channel there and like this video and share this video and have a fantastic day.